There is a largely forgotten chapter of World War II engineering that rarely gets discussed, you know, overshadowed by tanks, rifles and aircraft. But for anyone who studies the practical side of wartime survival, this forgotten piece of kit was as important as a weapon. Troops didn't just fight bullets. They fought mud, swamp, snowmelt and freezing rain. Across the Eastern Front alone, entire battalions sank into knee-deep sludge that swallowed equipment and destroyed boots. Rubber gear, already in short supply due to wartime rationing, cracked in the cold, tore under strain, and failed when soldiers needed it most. So militaries turned to something unexpected, a water barrier that wasn't made of rubber at all, yet resisted moisture, bending, tearing, and extreme temperatures far better than anything most civilians had access to. For the first minute of this guide, keep this in mind. A soldier didn't survive because of high technology. He survived because someone understood ancient materials better than the enemy understood weather. And that is where this barrier enters the story. Now, let's get into the real substance of what made this forgotten invention so, uh, effective. The barrier worked because fabric treated with natural oils and wax actually outperformed rubber in harsh conditions. Rubber, you know, was not the miracle many expected. Early war rubber hardened in the cold and became brittle, especially at sub-zero temperatures. It cracked under movement making it nearly useless for trenches, river crossings, and wet camps. The alternative that proved more reliable was a tightly woven canvas impregnated with a combination of linseed oil, beeswax, pine tar, and sometimes, well, lanolin. This wasn't soft fabric anymore. It turned into a stiff, semi-flexible shield that shed water like a metal plate. The mixture soaked into the fibres, expanded as it cured, and locked the weave together so tightly that liquid simply couldn't pass through. This canvas barrier didn't depend on elasticity like rubber did. Instead, it used density, fibre expansion, and hydrophobic compounds to keep water out. When the temperature dropped, it became slightly stiffer, but never brittle. When soaked, the fibres swelled and actually improved the barrier effect. And because it wasn't susceptible to cracking, soldiers could fold it, step on it, drag it across rocks, and still rely on it. This water barrier, you know, showed up in all sorts of gear, ponchos, ground cloths, rucksack covers, shelter halves, and even protective wraps for weapons and ammunition boxes. The very same piece of treated canvas could be a rain shield one day, a trench floor the next, and, when needed, a temporary sump line or even a bucket. Quite handy, really. Its superior performance, well, that came down to three interacting principles. First, the canvas weave gave it a structural strength that far exceeded those early rubber sheets. Second, the oils filled up all those microscopic gaps, turning the fabric into something close to a solid surface. And third, the waxes and tars hardened into a waterproof layer that rain would just, you know, slide right off. Because this barrier started with breathable materials, it didn't trap condensation in the same way rubber did. Soldiers could actually sleep under it without waking up soaked from sweat or all that moisture build-up. In intense cold, it didn't freeze into a stiff slab either. And, unlike rubber, 
It didn't break down under UV exposure during those long campaigns. All in all, it was a real step forward. Troops on the Western Front commonly used it as a ground barrier. Wet soil conducts cold rapidly, and, you know, a single night sleeping without insulation could lead to numb limbs or even early-stage frostbite. Laying the treated canvas beneath bedding reduced ground moisture significantly because water simply couldn't wick through. Soldiers often supplemented it with branches or straw, and the combination effectively doubled warmth retention. Along the Pacific Islands, soldiers used the barrier as a lean-to roof or a quick shield against those sudden monsoon rains. Rubber sheets sagged under the weight of water and tore from tension. Treated canvas stayed taut and allowed runoff to escape. Even when wind-driven rain hit at an angle, the barrier held its seal. In the Italian campaign, soldiers shaped these canvas sheets into improvised gaiters by wrapping and tying them around their lower legs. This prevented snow and mud from infiltrating boots, reducing trench foot cases. Those makeshift gaiters lasted longer than factory-issued rubber ones because, well, the material didn't degrade from repeated bending. One of the most surprising uses occurred during river crossings. When lashed tightly and sealed with additional wax, a square of the barrier could serve as a flotation aid for gear. Ammunition boxes stayed dry and rifles could be transported without risk of corrosion. While it wasn't meant to replace a boat, it kept essential equipment from being ruined, something rubber sheets of the time simply couldn't guarantee. The brilliance of this World War II innovation is that any enthusiast can reproduce it with basic supplies. Start with heavy cotton canvas, ideally number 10 or 12 duck. Melt beeswax and linseed oil in a double boiler until they combine, then add pine tar in smaller amounts to increase durability. Apply the mixture while warm so it soaks deeply into the fabric. Work section by section, using a brush or sponge, until the entire sheet is coated. Hang it outdoors to cure, allowing the sun and air to help the oils polymerize. Once cured, the canvas will darken and stiffen slightly, becoming waterproof and far more durable. This treated canvas works extremely well, as a ground cloth, a tarp, a pack liner, or even a cold weather windbreak. Unlike plastic tarps, it doesn't shred in high winds or become useless when punctured. Unlike rubberized gear, it won't crack or dry out. And you know, unlike synthetics, it can be repaired indefinitely with heat and fresh wax. If you want to test it, well, just pour water on the fresh-treated canvas once it's fully cured. You'll see the droplets bead and slide right off. Go ahead, fold it, step on it, bend it in the cold, and you'll understand immediately why World War II soldiers trusted this material over rubber. The barrier endured because it solved the problem with timeless materials rather than, you know, fragile technology. Wartime innovation didn't always mean metal and machinery. Sometimes the smartest solution came from understanding natural durability better than the enemy ever could. This treated canvas was proof that ancient methods, refined under pressure, could actually outperform industrial shortcuts. It outlasted rubber in mud, snow, rain, salt water, and those freezing winds, and it remains useful today for anyone who values rugged, dependable gear.
If guides like this help you rediscover forgotten wartime ingenuity, make sure to subscribe and share the video. The more people who keep this knowledge alive, the harder it becomes for history to disappear.